Question number three. Do the Gospels accurately preserve the activities of Jesus Christ? I want you to pay careful attention to how Craig is phrasing his answers because he's a very smart scholar. He says that the Gospels are in essential agreement with one another and we can pretty well know what Jesus says. He quotes E.P. Sanders about how uh, we know what Jesus said. E.P. Sanders agrees with me that there are discrepancies among the Gospels and there, are, uh, there is unreliable information scattered throughout the Gospels. And I want to know if Craig agrees with me because he says that the Gospel writers adapted the words of Jesus. That means they changed the words of Jesus. If they changed the words of Jesus, then how do we know where they've changed them and where do we know we're actually reading the words of Jesus? The same thing applies to Jesus' deeds. Can we trust what the Gospels say about what Jesus did? If the stories about Jesus were sometimes changed as Christians told and retold the stories as they adapted them, how do we know that they weren't changed a lot? before the Gospels were written down? Or are we to think that all four Gospels are 100% accurate with respect to Jesus' activities? If they're not 100% accurate, how do we know that they're at all accurate? And if we don't know how accurate they are, why should we trust them as historical sources? My own view is that it is absolutely certain that the Gospels did not give an accurate account of the things that Jesus did. For one thing, once again, there are many discrepancies in the accounts. As you can see for yourself, simply by reading them and comparing the Gospel stories for one another. Take any story in any of the Gospels and compare it in detail. Just do it yourself. Compare it in detail with the same story in another Gospel you will see multiple differences. But sometimes the stories are not simply different in minor detail. They are sometimes different in major ways. Let me give you just one example in the couple minutes I have left. Jesus, on the way to his death, in the Gospel of Mark, is completely silent. He carries his cross, or Simon of Cyrene carries his cross, and Jesus doesn't say a word. They nail him to the cross, and he's silent. He's hanging on the cross. Both robbers mock him. The passers-by mock him. Everybody mocks him, and he doesn't say anything until the very end. He cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he dies. That's the end of the story in Mark. Not quite, because then he gets raised from the dead. But how did he feel at the end? Compare that with the Gospel of Luke. In Luke, Jesus is not silent on the way to be crucified. He's going to be crucified, and he sees some women weeping for him by the side of the road, and he turns to them and says, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the faith that's to befall you. Jesus, in Luke's gospel, is more concerned about these women than he is about his own fate. When being nailed to the cross, in Luke's gospel, he's not silent. He says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. In Luke's gospel, he's hanging on the cross and he has an intelligent conversation with one of the robbers. Only one of the robbers mocks him in Luke. The other tells the first robber to be quiet because Jesus has done nothing to deserve this. He turns his head to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replies to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. In Luke's gospel, Jesus does not feel forsaken the way he does in Mark. In Luke's gospel, he knows he's on God's side. God is behind the proceeding. He knows what's going to happen to him. He knows why it's going to happen to him. He knows what's going to happen to him after it happens to him. He's going to wake up in paradise, and this guy's going to be with him in Luke's gospel. And at the end, rather than crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't say that in Luke. In Luke's gospel, he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he dies. This is a very different portrayal of Jesus going to his death from Mark. What everybody does, of course, is they take Mark's account and they take Luke's account and they smash them together into one big account. So Jesus says everything that he says in Mark, everything he says in Luke, then you throw in what he says in Matthew and what he says in John and you end up with the seven last words of the dying Jesus, which you find in none of the Gospels. You are free to do that, to smash them all together. 
So that Mark's portrayal isn't right, Luke's isn't right, what's right is the one that you've combined. But realize what you've done is you've written your own gospel, rather than trusting any of the gospels of the New Testament. The problem is the gospels of the New Testament do not agree either on the sayings of Jesus or on the deeds of Jesus. An eyewitness tradition. When I was a Bible-believing evangelical Christian uh, attending Moody Bible Institute, before I began my serious scholarship on the New Testament, before I began to read it in Greek, and before I saw what serious scholars of the world had to say about it, I was absolutely convinced that the Gospels not only contained eyewitness tradition, but that they were written by two eyewitnesses, Matthew and John, and by two people who were close companions to people who were eyewitnesses, Mark and Luke. Intense research has a way of changing your mind about things. But I don't want you to think that this is a reason for you not to use your brain. Even if you are the most hardcore, Bible-believing evangelical on the planet, you surely think that God gave you a brain. Use your brain. Craig and I will agree on this. God gave you a brain to think with. Apply reason. That's why God made you a human being instead of a slug. Don't be afraid of using your intelligence to find out the truth. The truth may not be what you were taught, but if it's true, you should believe it, not run from it. As I studied more and more using my intelligence as an evangelical, but also praying about it, I became convinced that the New Testament Gospels were not written by eyewitnesses or by people who knew eyewitnesses. The first point to make is the rather obvious one that the Gospels don't claim to be written by eyewitnesses. They are all anonymous. The titles in your Gospels, the Gospel according to Matthew and so forth, were added by later editors. They were not put there by the original authors. Second point, none of the Gospels claims to be written by the person whose name it bears. They don't claim to be written by eyewitnesses, and they don't claim to be written by people named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are later traditions that were added to the Gospels. These traditions do not start appearing for about a hundred years. Some people think that there is an early church father named Papias who attests to the witness of Mark and Matthew, but in fact there are very solid reasons for thinking that Papias, who lived around the year 120 to 140, is not referring to our Mark or our Matthew. The first time anybody refers to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John by name is Irenaeus in the year 180, a hundred years after these books were written. My understanding of the Gospels, as they've come down to us, is that they were anonymous and we don't know their names and they're not built on eyewitness testimony. But the important point that I want to make is that even if the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses or even if they did contain eyewitness accounts, that would not guarantee that they were accurate. Think about our legal system today. Are eyewitnesses always accurate in what they report? If so, why do we have trials that call in testimony more than one eyewitness? If eyewitnesses were always 100% accurate in what they report, we wouldn't need law courts. If we wanted to know what, would happen, what happened, we would simply ask somebody. Eyewitnesses do not always get all the information right, but even if they did, it wouldn't matter because the Gospels of the New Testament don't claim to be written by eyewitnesses, and in fact, they were not written by eyewitnesses. The Gospel writers were living 40 to 50 to 60 years after Jesus died. They wrote the Gospels in Greek. Jesus' language was Aramaic. These Gospel writers were living in a different country, Decades later, where did they get their information from? They were not the followers of Jesus. They don't claim to be followers of Jesus, the disciples. They're written by later people, decades later, in a different language. Where did they get their information from? They heard stories about Jesus that had been in circulation year after year after year, decade after decade, down to the time that the gospel writers living in a different country, speaking a different language, heard the stories. What happens to oral stories when they are transmitted orally? They change. 
The gospel writers have discrepancies among themselves because the stories that were told and retold were changed over time and the gospel writers themselves sometimes change the stories. That's why there are discrepancies. That's why scholars might be able to tell you generally what Jesus was about. They can list eight things that Jesus did, but they can't tell you the details and agree. Why can't scholars agree? Because there are so many discrepancies that the gospels are not reliable.